was about uh, in 1 Corinthians, you might say, oh, that's talking about prophecy and tongues, and you'd be right. That's what he's talking about. But uh, I, I chose the, the backdrop on this, which is uh, edification. It's uh, a building. It's bricks on top of each other because that's really the point of the whole chapter is that all things, the spiritual gifts, to be directed in the direction of building up or edifying uh, the assembly or the church that belongs to Christ. And so this morning, what we're going to talk about, very briefly, is how we got to chapter 14, starting back in chapter 12. In chapter 12, Paul illustrates that the Spirit gives gifts, many varied and different gifts, just as he wills in the body, is manifested in different ways through the body of Christ and the, the work of individuals. But all of this was given for the common good. If you look back at chapter 12, verses 7 through 11, that's his point. Is these gifts are given for the common good. And in chapter 13, he goes in to say that, well, if you don't have love, then all of these gifts that are given by the Spirit really are of no use. They're of no benefit to the person who has them. So in chapter 14, he's going to be talking about how the gatherings or the church assemblies that we're, like we're taking part in today should focus on edification, which is building up. I've already been edified this morning, and I hope that you have as well. But when we come together, that should be our focus, is to build one another up. Uh, yes, to remember the Lord's Supper, very important, but the Lord died so that we would uh, be unified, that we would be built up and then take on the work of the Lord and become more like Christ. So here's today's outline. Is we're going to be talking about Paul's idea of this greater gift and what the greater gift is. He's going to be comparing two gifts in this chapter. He's going to be stressing the importance that when it comes to gifts that are used for edification, it's important that uh, what you're saying is understood. So they had, you might remember, uh, a pride in that, the, that they could speak in tongues, that they could speak in other languages, but oftentimes they would use these and they couldn't be understood in the assembly. In fact, uh, has anyone ever visited a, a Pentecostal church? Uh, sometimes you may have experienced uh, speaking in tongues, perhaps, or that, what they call speaking in tongues. Uh, and a lot, many times this is not something that is, that is understood. And then he's going to give two more points, and one being... Uh, that it applies to believers, and the other one is going to be uh, for unbelievers. Yeah, if you want to go and tell them that, that you're welcome to come in. So the first one is this greater gift. Let's uh, think about what is this greater gift uh, that Paul is talking about here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, let's just read the first five verses. It starts off and says, pursue love. That's what he's been talking about in chapter 13. Pursue love yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. <clears throat> for one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. For no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks, or it's really not, uh, this is a New American Standard version. It inserts the word his there, but that's not in the original language. In spirit he speaks mysteries. But one who prophesies speaks to men for edification, exhortation, consolation. Or, or comfort. In verse 4, one who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but one who prophesies edifies the church. Now I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you would prophesy. And greater is one who prophesies than one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets so that the church may receive edifying. <coughs> there, there's something called a, um, everybody, anybody ever heard of a literary device called a chiasm? It's a structure. It's something that works. It's kind of the same on both sides, and it works its way in, and then it comes back out again. So a lot of poems are written like that, where it starts with an idea, and it finishes with the same idea, and there's something in the middle, and when you look in the middle, there's usually some significance to what's in the middle. <coughs> well, we see that is here in this, in this text, and it's kind of, it's kind of uh, disguised because of the natural chapter breaks, but if you go back to chapter 12 and verse 31, he says, earnestly desire the greater gifts. And then in 14.1, he says, earnestly desire spiritual gifts. In the middle is chapter 13, which is talking about love. So at the end of chapter 12, he says, earnestly desire the, the greater gifts, and I show you still a more excellent way. And he goes in to talk about what the more excellent way is. And at the end of that, he says in chapter 14.1, pursue love again, and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts <coughs> or spiritual things. And so keeping that in mind, it's a transition. He's not completely changing subjects. It's a transition from one thought, and all this kind of flows together. All the gifts are supposed to be used with this agape love that he talked about. 
in chapter 13, and we talked about last week. So if we look at chapter 14, verse 1, <coughs> this is my translation of the, of the text, and I've given you the New American Standard Version. I'm, I give it to you a little bit differently just to kind of provoke your thought into what these words mean, and so you may think about the verse in a slightly different way. I use aggressively chase. That's what pursue means, is to aggressively chase something. In fact, the same word is used uh, in a negative case when they were persecuting Christians. Uh, that means aggressively chasing them. Persecute. Uh, it's a negative idea. So uh, we need to pursue this or aggressively chase love. Uh, we need to earnestly desire. That means be zealous for. Now, zealous is good and it's bad. If, if you're desiring uh, bad things, we call that jealousy. Or if you're jealous or zealous in the wrong way. Like Joseph, uh, his brothers were jealous over him, if, you, if you've been reading uh, our Old Testament studies. But he's saying, more or rather than, and the, and the King James Version does a good job rendering this, and this is the focus of that. This is why we should aggressively chase love. This is why we should desire the gifts, not so that we can be some kind of showboat or be better than everybody else, but so that, that's the reason behind them, <coughs> is that so that we can prophesy. Now, what does he mean by prophesy? He, we, we think about that when I think a prophecy is normally telling the future. Somebody predicted something and it comes to pass. Well, he's going to talk about the importance of prophecy. And he uses prophecy, and he's going to define it in just a moment. But prophecy is a, a spiritual utterance. It's a, it, it, it includes revelation. It includes edification, building up. But there is a sense in which we may prophesy today if we're speaking God's word in an assembly. But in this case, in, in, in verse 1, he is talking about a miraculous uh, prophecy. But why is prophecy better than tongues? Why is it better? Why is it the, more, the better thing? Why is it the thing that we should pursue? Well, he tells us in verse 2. He says, For the one speaking in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. And, and some uh, people would understand this. If, if you're from a Pentecostal background, they say, that, Well, this is an angelic tongue. It's something I'm speaking directly to God. But that's not what he means, he, and I'll explain it in a moment. He says, the one speaking in a tongue or a language doesn't speak to men but to God, for no one understands, he's explaining it, no one understands, and in the spirit he speaks mysteries. I think what he's saying is simply that if a language isn't interpreted, only God knows what he's saying. Even if, say, God uh, miraculously gave me the ability to study, uh, to speak French, and I've never studied it before. I could be up here speaking in French, God is the only one that would be hearing it. No one else would be, because no one else understands it. So in the spirit, I am speaking it, but to everybody else, it's a mystery. It's something that's hidden. The content of the message is hidden. <coughs> Verse 3, however, look at this. He says, and the one prophesying, or but the one prophesying, comparing somebody speaking a foreign language to somebody who is prophesying, the one prophesying speaks, and he mentions three things here, three important things, edification, exhortation, and what's the other one? Consolation or comfort. Right here in this verse, we have a good definition of the purpose and what prophecy really is designed to do. Notice that telling the future is not in here. If I ask you what prophecy was, a lot of times people, well, it's, it's, a, it's an announcement of something and later it's, it's a prediction of something and it comes to pass later. But that's not how uh, Paul is using the word here. He's saying that prophecy is someone, someone speaking edification. That means somebody who's speaking words of God and building them up. That is exhortation. Exhortation means a strong urging to do God's will, trying to convict somebody to do God's will. Comfort is provide encouragement. Uh, we often we get discouraged, providing consolation and, and, and encouragement in that way. And so those are the three important things we need to think about when we're thinking about in terms of exhortation, uh, in, th in, in terms of prophecy. And now you see why prophecy is really if you define it this way, is more beneficial than just speaking a foreign language. Now, if you can do both, now you're on to something. But just speaking a foreign language, <coughs> that's not really that spectacular, although it is a gift from the Spirit. In verse 4, he says, the one speaking in a tongue builds himself up. He's the only one benefiting. <coughs> the one prophesying builds up an assembly. That will be, you know, he's building up the church, but it's really a church. It's an indefinite thing. If you can if you can build up a church, that is what's more important. And you see, as you probably know and have studied this book, the Corinthians, they were just using their gifts, specifically their gifts in tongues, to really, you know, as Mike says, you know, really put their thumbs underneath their arms and really boast themselves up. <coughs> but prophecy was to build up everyone else and make other people uh, benefit from it. 
And so what's interesting is that he uses this word edify, edification, some variation of this word four times in these, four, in these verses from verses 3 through 5. So he's really refocusing the desire to have spiritual gifts on the intended goal, which is to build up uh, the Lord's church. Now in verse 5 he says, And I desire all of you to speak in tongues, and rather so that you all might prophesy. Like I said before, it's, 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 it's even a better trick if you can prophesy and speak in tongues, because you're building up in another language. He says, And greater is the one prophesying than the one speaking in tongues, unless he might interpret, so that the assembly might receive edification. Now, Paul's not saying that they will all speak in tongues. In chapter 12 and verse 30, he says, All will not speak in tongues, will they? And the, and the idea was that they would not. But prophecy is greater in tongues, uh, with one exception, that the guy speaking the other language could do both. He could speak in another language and build up, unless he could interpret and really, like I said before, and like he said before, so that, the reason is, every time you see so that, that's, there's a reason there. And you should think about that. He's giving you the reason why he just said something. It's because the, the assembly or the church is built up. Now, the thing for us to, to uh, think about, you know, I, I've never miraculously, and you probably haven't ever uh, miraculously spoken another language you haven't studied. You haven't been miraculously imparted some kind of uh, prophetic knowledge that you never had before. Uh, but the first century church, that was happening. So how do we apply it to us? Well, I think, we th I think that even today, God gives us special abilities, and we need to think about what's our motivation for having those? <coughs> what's our desire? Is it so that we can uh, build up others? Is it so that we can build up ourselves? Are we doing it out of love? Are we doing it out of just uh, pride and, and showboating? Well, in, in comparison with prophecy in tongues, there's an importance here about being understood when you're using gifts. <coughs> um, he's going to be talking about, uh, specifically, the, when you use uh, these foreign languages in assembly, if people don't understand you, it really doesn't help. Let me read verses 6 through 12, and you can follow along in your text if you like. This is from the New American Standard Bible. <coughs> but now, brethren, if I come to you speaking in tongues... What will I profit you unless I speak to you either by way of revelation, or of knowledge, or of prophecy, or of teaching? Yet even lifeless things, either flute or harp, in producing a sound, if they do not produce a distinction in the tones, how will it be known what is played on the flute or the harp? For if the bugle produces an indistinct sound, who will prepare himself for battle? So also you, unless you utter the tongue, speech that is clear, how will it be known what is spoken? for you will be speaking to the air. There are perhaps a great many kinds of languages in the world, and no, no kind is without meaning. If then I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be to the one who speaks a barbarian, and the one who speaks will be a barbarian to me. So also you, since you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church. Now let's look at this verse by verse. Uh, in the first verse, he introduces this rhetorical question, saying, <clears throat> If I was to come to you and speak in these other languages... I would not profit you anything, would I? Unless four conditions are met. Unless you got some kind of revelation from me in that language. Unless you understood some knowledge. <coughs> unless you understood some word of prophecy, some teaching. So it's a, it's a rhetorical question, really, that is driving at his main point. Perhaps, just like the Corinthians thought less of Paul as an apostle because he wouldn't take their money, because he didn't speak with eloquent speech, because uh, all these other number of reasons, perhaps because he didn't come to them speaking in all these tongues, they thought perhaps he was less of an apostle. There seems to be some kind of uh, apologetic or defensive tone in this. But if not, I think his, his point is that the, the audience must benefit from the things that are spoken. Being understood is important. And he uses this interesting example about musical instruments. You find this interesting. He says, even lifeless things give... Uh, give a voice. Now, uh, my translation said sound or make a sound. But I'm kind of losing something when I translate that, although he, he is talking about the sounds instruments make. Literally, he's talking about how everything has a voice. Humans have voices. Even a musical instrument has a voice, per se. And so literally, he says, even, even like a musical flute or a harp, you could say a guitar or any instrument you may like, all these things have voice. But if they don't, not distinct with their notes, if, if they're not understood, how are you going to understand what's being played? Uh, what's the whole purpose of playing a song? 
It's so that you can enjoy the song, so other people can enjoy the song. Otherwise, it's just racket. It's just noise, and nobody understands it. You can't identify it if it's not unique. So just like the purpose of playing a musical instrument is to be understood, the purpose of a language is to be understood. And that's his point. He goes on furthermore to talk about a war trumpet. Now, a war trumpet is an instrument that's played not to be enjoyed, but to issue a command. And, and, and really, languages are the same way. Languages from God's instructions are issued by languages to issue commands for the hearers to do something. Now, in this case, he says, even a war trumpet, should give, if it should give an indistinct sound or indistinct voice, who will prepare himself for war? Now, have you ever watched one of those old Civil War movies, <coughs> and they're all on horseback, and the guy blows the bugle? He goes, you know, like, you know, that's the charge, I think, isn't it? Is that Grant? Is that charge? <coughs> no? Well, we'll talk to Grant later about that. But if I'm not mistaken, the bugler knows several different, that was a, a way of communicating on the battlefield. Uh, they had one for charge, they had one for retreat, they had perhaps some for other things. But if the guy, if the bugler doesn't know and he can't communicate with those things, nobody's going to do the right thing on the battlefield. And that's the same thing. There's no benefit from playing it. So you see the analogy here. There's no benefit to having a language if you can't communicate the commands from God to other people. And there's nothing, uh, nothing gained there. So in verse 9 he says, In this manner also you, unless you give a clear word through the tongue, how will the thing be spoken be known? For you will be speaking into the air. Just like the trumpeter is blowing into the air and nobody's hearing him, it's the same way if we're speaking. We might as well just, we're speaking that God understands, but nobody else does. And so he's applying the analogy, obviously, to tongues, that languages must be clearly communicated, as we've said before. Otherwise, there's no benefit to it. In verse 10, he says, There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world. You just may say, languages, but again, he's saying voices, just like humans have voices, just like the instruments have voices in this analogy. There's so many kinds of voices in the world, and not one is without voice. Uh, now, it's interesting, we don't really know what Paul means here. Some people, and some translators translate this as no languages without meaning, and that's certainly true. Uh, literally, it's no one is, it could be say no one is without a language. Everyone has a language, but in any case, it's clear that, that voices or languages are used by everybody to communicate. And I think he just further drives the point home. So in verse 11 he says, If then I do not know the power of the voice or the force by which it's spoken, I will be to one speaking barbarous, and the one speaking to me will be barbarous. Now barbarous is, we would say, they're just saying blah, 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 blah. I mean, when you speak another language, if you're in a place where another language is spoken, it kind of sounds like, you were described to somebody, it's like, blah, 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 blah. You know, I didn't understand anything. But in ancient Greek, they would say, they were just saying, bar, 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 bar. And that's where the term barbarian came from, if you didn't know that. So if, if I can't communicate with them and they can't communicate to, with us, in this case, it was the Greek language. Anybody who didn't speak Greek or Latin, they were, barbar they were barbarous. You know, they just didn't make any sense. And so that's his, that's his uh, illustration here. <coughs> in verse 12, he says, in this manner also you, since you're zealous of spiritual things, which implies that they, they were zealous for things, they were just not focused on it in the right way. He says, now that since you are zealous, seek so that, or in a manner, that you may abound toward the building up of the assembly. See, he's redirecting their motivation here. He says, I know you're zealous, but do it so that you may abound in a particular thing, and that is edifying, building up. Use your gifts in that way. So the question for us is, are we motivated to build up others in our assemblies? You know, I was thinking about this. <clears throat> Sometimes we come, perhaps, just to build up ourselves. I'm going to come to see what I can get out of it. And when I can no longer get what I want out of it, then I'm not going to participate anymore. I'm going to take my ball and go home. But really, what he's saying is, all of you are supposed to come together and bring your unique gifts to build up the assembly, each, each building up each other. And that's the point. Now, again, back to our main point here, he's, he's, he's talking about the comparison between tongues and prophecy. Their problem at this point in time is, is building up and really uh, becoming prideful over tongues. So he's going to give an application for believers. Uh, if you want to follow along with me, chapter 14, 
13 through 19, he says, Therefore, let one who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What is the outcome then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with the mind also. I will sing with the spirit, and I will sing with the mind also. Otherwise, if you bless with the, in the spirit only, how will the one who fills the place of the ungifted say the amen after your giving of thanks, since he does not know what you're saying? For you're giving thanks well enough, but the other person's not edified. I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. However, in the church, I desire to speak five words with my mind so that I may instruct others rather than 10,000 words in a tongue. So it's interesting, again, um, he's, he's saying that uh, on account, verse 13, on account of which, meaning looking back to uh, the idea that they should be motivated by building up each other, on account of that, let each one speak, or let each one uh, speaking in a tongue pray that he might interpret it also. We said the only thing better than prophesying is being able to prophesy in another language or to speak in another language. So that's what the one who speaks the language should pray for, is that he could interpret in such a way that would build other people up. Now, it's unclear to me what verse 14 means. Uh, if you want to look at that, maybe you could tell me <coughs> after the lesson. He says, For if I should pray in a tongue, my spirit prays and my mind is unfruitful. Well, how is he, how is he praying in the spirit? How is his mind being unfruitful? Those are the questions we want to, we, that, are, that are a little ambiguous. What we do know is that he is praying in a language. That's miraculous uh, through the Spirit. Uh, how his mind is unfruitful, we don't know because we've never actually miraculously spoken another language, more than likely. But when he was, the, the question is, when they were speaking the other language miraculously, did they understand what they were saying? Or did they not understand what they were saying? Uh, but to be productive, here's the point, is that we can be sure of this. To be productive in prayer, it must be understood. It must be understood by me, what I'm saying, for me to be productive in it. It must be under, uh, understood by you, for it to be productive for you. So notice we've talked about a couple things here in this text. We're talking about uh, speaking languages to other, other another, prophesying to one another. Here we're talking about praying. He's going to be talking about singing. These are different acts of worship, in essence. So look at verse 15. What then is it, or what is the point of all this? is what he, he's basically saying. He introduces the conclusion. He says, I will pray, or when I pray here, he's going to pray, yes, with the help of the Spirit, but he's also going to pray with his mind so that he understands it, and so that other people understand it. And he says, I will sing with the Spirit, but I'll also sing with the mind. If I got up here and started singing in another language, that's not really going to help anybody. So he's going to do two things. He's going to sing, yes, use the gift of the Spirit, but also sing with his mind so that he understands it. And I think that's the, the main point of this, is his concern is not only use the spiritual gift of tongues to pray, but do it in a way that others can understand. Now, verse 16, he says, since if you should bless, now this is a different idea. We, before, we were just talking about praying. Here, we're talking about a specific kind of prayer, perhaps, a, a giving of thanks. He says, since you, if you should bless with the Spirit... How will the one filling the place of the uneducated say the amen with your giving of thanks, since what you, since what, uh, you say he's not known? Now, uneducated, your translation may sound gifted. This is just somebody who doesn't speak the language. If somebody comes in, maybe they're, uh, they just don't know what you're saying. They don't speak that language. Well, if you're saying a prayer and, and, and giving a blessing, if you will, with the spirit or the spiritual tongue, how are they going to be able to put their amen on it? Which, which gives, gives us an illustration, it's a, um, it's, a, it's a textual proof, if you will, for the saying amen after a prayer, for everybody saying amen after a prayer. If you were to ask people, why does everybody say amen after the prayer, you could go to this verse and show an example about how it's a biblical concept. You ever thought about that? Like, why do we do that? Well, it's, amen said, it really means this is true. Uh, when, when Jesus would say, uh, verily, verily, I say to you, or truly, truly, I say to you, what in the, in the Greek, it's amen, amen. And so when we put that on the end of a prayer, what we're saying is, this is true. And if, I can't say if it's true or not if I can't understand you. And in fact, if you're ever somewhere and you can't understand the prayer, you probably shouldn't put your amen on it because you don't know if you're, what you're saying is true. Uh, and, and here's another I, I, I thinking of 
if we use words or phrases or terminology in our prayers that are not easily understood, that's prohibiting other people from being edified as well. Verse 17 says, For indeed you're giving thanks well, I mean your prayer is good, but the other one's not being built up. It could be the best prayer in Russian that anybody's ever heard, but it's not doing me any good because I can't understand it. I can't put my amen on it. And, and here's a, a verse that tells us that even a prayer that's giving thanks can build up the listener. Here I am, somebody's giving thanks to God, but all the listeners are being built up. Uh, it shows public thanksgiving to God actually is, is intended to build up those who are participating in it. And so if we use words or phrases, um, I was thinking probably in another hundred years or two hundred years or so, there's going to be phrases we use today that people are not going to understand. And so you need to pray in a way that people can actually say amen and understand it. You know, a funny story, my, my grandfather still, he prays in King James. It, it, it just all the, all the these and the thous and the yees and, and all those things. And I know what he means, and probably most of you do, but in a couple of generations, people may not understand that. So verse 18 and 19, he says, I give thanks to God, I speak with tongues more than all of you. But in church, I desire to speak five words with my mind so that I might instruct others than countless words with a tongue. So he's not being arrogant here. It kind of sounds like an arrogant thing to say. I'm glad I speak tongues more than all of you. But it's just the idea that if anybody had a, a reason to boast over speaking in tongues, it would have been Paul. But yet what Paul chose to do when he went to Corinth is not speak in tongues. It was to speak a very simple language. And because he spoke so simply, they didn't think, they, they looked down on him of it. You know, that's one of the things that he said earlier in the book is, I didn't come with eloquence of speech. You know, I came in weakness and fear and trembling. And so he did not present it in the way that was wise or did not present it in the way that they thought that he should. Perhaps they wanted him to speak in tongues to exercise his gifts. That wasn't the result he was looking for. He wanted to build up the church. Just a side note, uh, this, this countless, this word 10,000 that's often translated just means countless. It's tens of thousands. It's a myriad is the Greek word. And he would rather speak a few words than countless words uh, in, a, in a foreign language. So... Do we flaunt our gifts in front of others? That's the application question here. Paul chose not to flaunt his gifts in front of others. Uh, how could we do this? Well, um, if you spoke a foreign language, I guess you could, that would be the most direct application, if you could flaunt that in front of others. Um, even, even as a preacher, you know, I'm studying Greek, you know. If I'm, if I'm up here talking about blah, 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 all this stuff in Greek, and you don't understand a thing I'm talking about, and it's not edifying you, I try to make it so it does, but if that's it, that could be flaunting. Say if, if somebody has a lot of money, they could be, that'd be as a gift from God, they could flaunt that. There's all kinds of things that we're gifted by that we could be flaunting in front of others that we have to be careful about. And so here's, again, back to our main point, tongues versus prophecy. Prophecy being edification, uh, words, words of revelation used to comfort people, used to exhort people versus this flashy tongue-speaking gift over here. Here's, here's the application for unbelievers. And going back to our text, picking up in verse 20, he says... Brethren, do not be children in your thinking, yet in evil be infants, but in your thinking be mature. In the law it is written, by men of strange tongues and by lips of strangers I will speak to this people, and even so they'll not listen to me, says the Lord. So then tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophecy is for a sign, not to unbelievers, but to those who believe. Therefore, if the whole church assembly together is together and all speak in tongues, and an ungifted or unbeliever enters, will they not say that you're mad? But if all prophesy, and an unbeliever or ungifted man enters, he's convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed, so that he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring that God is certainly among you. So here in this, in this he's really given the climax of, of, of the difference between uh, prophecy and the difference between tongues and prophecy for believers and for unbelievers. Verse 20 says, don't become children in your thinking, or don't be children in your thinking. That is what the Corinthians were doing. They were being childlike. Hey, I got this gift, you know, let me use it. That was being childish. Uh, in fact, they were looking down on people who didn't have the gift, and that's wickedness. So he's saying, be mature in your thinking with the gift. Don't be wicked with the gift. Be infants, you know, in, in regard to the evil that you're doing. Uh, but in your thinking, be mature. 
Now, it's interesting that this word mature here that is, is the same word he uses in chapter 13, verse 10, which is the, completed, uh, the completion of something. Remember when he says, when the perfect comes, that, that means the perfect revelation of God? He used it in that context, saying we know parts of the revelation and other parts we don't know, but when it's completed, when the perfect comes. Here he's talking about the word perfect, or can also mean, be translated mature, uh, full grown, it's the completed end of something. And so here, he wants us to grow up into this matureness in which we can use these gifts uh, for God's glory, which is edifying the church. In malice, we should be like infants. We should not be developed in our thinking in that way. In verse 21, he goes on and he uses scripture. Uh, it's a clever use of Isaiah's prophecy. Now, if you're not familiar with this, you may want to take the time to go back and read that. But in Isaiah 28, verses 11 and 12, <clears throat> God sends the prophet Isaiah against the northern kingdom, uh, Ephraim, or you may call it Israel, and what's going to happen is they're not, they're not listening to God, and so God's going to send the Assyrians to come and capture them. And what he says is even though they're going to be captured and spoken to people by foreign languages, in this case the Assyrians, it's not going to turn them back to God. And so it's a clever use by Paul here. He's saying that even though foreigners are going to capture Israel, it's not going to cause them to repent. So his main point is this, foreign languages, if not understood, don't, don't achieve God's will, which is it doesn't make people turn back to God. A foreign languages don't lead people to repentance. So here's, the, here's the, the upshot in verse 22. He says, tongues are for a sign to, and I'm going to simplify this, tongues are, to a, are a sign for unbelievers. And why is that? It's because I take the gospel to a foreign land in their foreign language, in this case, the Assyrian language did not convict the Hebrews. However, the Hebrews, if they spoke Assyrian, they might be able to convict the Assyrians. That's the purpose that God gave this speaking in tongues. Why did God allow people in the first century to speak all these miraculous tongues? Well, the gospel message had to go out very quickly into all these different nations. And so he's correcting them on this point. However, prophecy, meaning this uh, conviction, this edification, this building up, that's to be used for people who are believing already, to get them and to, to build them up. They're already believers. They're already in the assembly. And so really, they're not supposed to be using all these tongues as a show in the assembly. They're supposed to be using prophecy. And he uses, he uses um, this in verse 23. Again, he says, if the whole church would come together and speak in tongues, other people are just going to think you're crazy. They're going to think you're insane if they come in seeing that. It's just going to be total chaos. Again, this uneducated people is people who haven't been taught um, it's going to be counterproductive to the thing that they're trying to do. And in verse 24, he goes on, but he says, if, all, if everybody should prophesy, now let me, let me back up and say, if everybody speaks in tongues, that's a disaster. But if everybody prophesies, that's beneficial because everybody's being convicted of their sin. All their sins are being exposed, they're being examined by everyone, and the outsiders are more likely to get convicted as well as the believers because he says that back in verse 22. So everybody prophesying, that's a good problem. Everybody speaking in tongues in the assembly, that's a bad problem. Now, verse 24 tells us why everybody prophesying is a good thing, and that's because it exposes the hidden things of the heart. It expose, if, I come to, if I come to the assembly, and I walk up to Jeremy, and, and he's speaking the words of the Lord to me and convicting me. Then I walk over to Rich, and he, the things out of his mouth are seasoned with salt, and he's speaking the words of the Lord to me. And I go to Mike, and he's doing the same thing. And as I walk around, and I'm in that assembly, everybody's doing that. Then the more likely somebody who's visiting or one of us, we're going to be convicted by the words of the Lord. However, if I walk up to Jeremy, and he speaks Russian, and I walk up to Rich, and he speaks French, and I walk up to Grant, and he speaks Chinese, See, I'm not all being convicted uh, in the same way. So that's, that's the idea is that these outsiders, they're going to be convicted of their sins, and as a result, they're going to bow down before God, they're going to uh, worship God, and they're going to say, wow, God is among these people because of, uh, because of what's happened to them. Otherwise, it's just going to cause uh, mass confusion. So that was our outline today. Um, we still have not answered the question how a bunch of prophecy at one time works in the assembly or how even speaking tongues work in the assembly. That's what we're going to talk about next time I speak is he's going to be saying all these things have to be done in a way that's orderly so that, so that edification can occur. 
But that was, that was the lesson for today, that, that there is a greater gift, and that's prophecy. And I want you to think a little bit, <clears throat> I don't want to say outside the box, because that sounds like outside the Bible. But um, remember the definition that he gave of prophecy. It was edification, it was um, consolation, and exhortation. The same can be done today by using the prophecy that's been revealed, by using God's word. We can use this, we can speak it to others, and we can achieve the same result. And so with that in mind, I want us to ask ourselves a couple uh, questions. Does our preaching expose sin? If our preaching is mainly designed to make ourselves feel good and boast, then that's not good preaching. If our preaching uh, exposes people's sin and helps them see sin, then that's good. That's what, that's what it's supposed to be doing. Uh, sometimes people just preach about things that they know they'll just get an amen on. And that's not, that's not right. We've got to preach on the hard things as well. Uh, you know, it's, it's easy to preach the easy sermons that everybody's going to agree with. We also have to preach the sermons that convict, not just believers, but, but unbelievers. And that brings me to my second point. Do our, does our uh, preaching or even teaching... You know, if th this is a good thing. Even in the workplace, does our teaching expose people's sin? Or is it just, to, do we teach people just so they like us? Or do we hold back certain things so that, so that we have an intended result that's, that's uh, just for our benefit? Here's the, inten the intention, is that our, our uh, dialogue in the assembly, as well as um, in the workplace, should be so that it convicts people of sin. Because if people are not convicted of sin, they're not going to be, looking for a solution to that sin. Does that make sense? You can't, like I, I've used this example before, you can't go to an Eskimo and sell him a refrigerator unless he thinks he has a problem of his food getting, you know, spoiling. And the same way is we cannot take the gospel to the world and have them accept the truth of, G, of God and forgiveness of sins if they don't actually first realize that they have sin. So our preaching, our prophecy, if you want to say that, speaking the words of God, needs to convict unbelievers. Sometimes we just say things um, without any thought as to whether it's convicting or not. Maybe we're just, I'm just going to throw the truth out there. I don't care if it makes you mad or not and go on. But it's kind of like, that's not, we need to actually put some thought into how we're saying these things so that the end result is somebody becomes convicted of their sin and turns to God. Does it build up? Does it exhort? Does it encourage? Does our preaching do that? And I, I, I say these things uh, for me, myself. Does my preaching build up? I hope so. Does it exhort? Does it tell you what God's word is? Does it encourage you? And for the other men who, are, who give lessons here, we need to ask ourselves these things. Does, is, it, is it achieving these purposes? And do others among us, would they say, wow, God is among them because they're doing this thing? Now, in the, later in chapter 14, he's going to talk about how when people come to the assembly, everybody is prepared Somebody has a song, somebody has a, a, a tongue in that case, somebody has a prophecy, somebody has a teaching. And so it was a little bit different, I think, in the fact that, yeah, everything was decently in order, but, but people were coming to the assembly with a mindset to build up other people, and everybody was prepared to do that. So I hope that, that we will think that way, because in an environment like that, other people who are among us, they can't help but get built up. They can't help but be convicted of their sin. They can't help but say, wow, God is among them. And so that's the question for today is, is God among us? Would other people see that? And I hope so. If, if somebody here this morning doesn't feel like the, that God is with them, you know, that for some reason they have some burden of conscience, they have some sin that's, that's holding them back from God, we want to give you a chance to repent of that so that God can work more fully in your life uh, perhaps, you know, I, I, there's been times in my life where you're, you're holding something back from God and you feel like guilty of this is on your conscience. Well, you don't necessarily have to do that in a public way, but I hope that you would leave today with that issue resolved. And if it needs to be something that's publicly confessed, it's something that you're in too deep and you need the prayers of the saints, then we want you to get that resolved as well. There's no reason anybody should walk out the door today not feeling 100% right with God. And we want to give you the opportunity to do that this morning as we stand and sing the song that's been